Son of man, great I am, King of heaven, Son of God, rule the measure of my days. Holy Lamb, spotless Lamb, you are worthy, I am not, before your throne I stand amazed. Every tongue confess and every knee will bow to Jesus Christ the Lord forever. Hear our praises now. Your name is matchless. Your name is priceless. Your name is more than I could know. You're so far above me. The way that you love me is further than any love could go. Wonderful Counselor, Root of David, Morning Star, You are the way, the truth, the life. Lion of the tribe of Judah, Mighty God is who you are, The only perfect sacrifice. Every tongue confess and every knee will bow To Jesus Christ the Lord forever, Hear our praises now. Your name is matchless. Your name is priceless. Your name means more than I could know. You're so far above me. The way that you love me is further than any love could go. Son of man, great I am, King of heaven, Son of God, you hold the measure of my days. Holy Lamb, spotless Lamb, you are worthy, I am not, before your throne I stand amazed. Every tongue confess and every knee will bow to Jesus Christ the Lord forever. Hear our praises now. Your name is matchless. Your name is priceless. Your name is more than I could know. You're so far above me. The way that you love me is further than any love could go. In your name you took the blind man and you gave him back his sight. took this prisoner and you opened up the doors and I will sing before your throne forevermore your name is matchless your name is priceless your name is more than I could know you're so far above me the way that you love me is further than any love could go your name is matchless, your name is priceless, your name is more than I could know. You're so far above me, the way that you love me is further than any love could go. Your name is matchless, your name is priceless, your name is more than I could know. You're so far above me, the way that you love me is further than any
stories and what they think you're like But I've heard the tender whisper of love the dead of night you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone You're a good, good father for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father to you are to you are stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father, so you are. perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways love so undeniable I, I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me still into love, 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 you're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of Ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You're a good one.
has shown thee.
In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. I lift up. to say it again. I love you. I love you, Lord. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for loving us all so very much. God, we love you back. And thank you, Lord, that when we were still in our sin, you saved us still. Lord, we'll never understand all of it, but we just want to give you the, the gratitude that you're owed. In Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, thank you for your word. And we just uh, pray in advance, God, for what you want to say to us tonight and this incredible story of um, the flood. God, just um, teach us and... Um, minister to us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So today's message is Noah's Ark. As we keep studying chapter 6, we're going to finish chapter 6 tonight. And as we said, we're now in that uh, section, the flood of Noah, which takes place in chapters 6 through 9. We saw last time how mankind had reached the point of no return. He was uh, wicked Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, the Bible says. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And so that brings us to chapter 6, verse 9. And remember, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That was the last verse of that previous section. So verse 9, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah's a, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. He was a just man or righteous man. It could be translated, and it's the first time this word is used in the Bible, just or righteous. And the word perfect is tamim in the Hebrew, and it means uncontaminated blameless, having moral integrity. And this was the same terminology used of the animal sacrifices when it said they had to be without blemish. Same word, perfect in his ways. So tamim, without blemish. And it appears at this point, Noah was the only one who had faith and walked with God on the face of the earth. Out of the possible millions who were on the earth, or possibly billions, and this is not saying that Noah was sinless, but that he didn't behave as the wicked of his day. He was uncontaminated by the sin that was the result of the sons of God taking wives of the daughters of men. And so Noah's described by three phrases here, a righteous man or a just man, blameless and he walked with God. And remember, 
Enoch walked with God, and then he was not, because God took him, right? Noah walked with God, and God spared him from the flood. Do you see a pattern here? Pattern starting to happen for those who walk with God. Uh, Matthew says in his commentary, Noah was a righteous man, and with God walked Noah. There is no other person besides these ancient patriarchs, Enoch and Noah, who have this distinction, walk with God. And of course, walking with God is not an activity reserved for them, but God desires us all to walk with him, right? We walk by faith, not by sight, the Bible says. We walk in the Spirit. And John the Apostle said, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, Peter called Noah a preacher of righteousness, meaning not only was his life a sermon in itself, I mean, Noah's life was a very sermon, as our lives are supposed to be too, but he also preached it as well. Noah warned and he urged the people to repent, but the people didn't want to have anything to do with it at that time. It's possible Noah preached this for about 100 years before the ark was completed. And that's much like what's happening more and more in our day and age. People just don't want to hear it anymore. In some ancient writings, Noah is depicted as a preacher who was forewarning of the doom coming, but the people instead sneered at him, each one calling him demented and a man gone mad. And you can understand that to a certain degree as he's building a boat, which they had never seen before, in his backyard, right? Josephus' account says that he felt threatened for his life, And Martin Luther said more than one miracle was necessary to prevent the ungodly from surrounding and killing him. I bet. I bet bet God was very active uh, in this whole thing as Noah was preparing the ark. And so he preached righteousness. But like any preacher of righteousness, he had his enemies and his critics and he suffered persecution. If you're going to speak the truth, you're going to be persecuted. Verse 10. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, these three sons are going to come into play later on in chapter 10. The important one is going to be Shem, who ultimately becomes the father of the Shemites, or the Jews. And we've said already that the word Semitic comes from that word Shem. It's Shemitic. But the fascinating thing is the entire Earth's population today is a descendant of one of these three guys. I mean, when you think about it, we're all descendants of one of these three guys. And looking at the map, this is kind of where they uh, dispersed around the area and settled, Shem being in that area known as Israel and Arabia and partially in Persia as well. Verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And look at the Hebrew word there, Hamas. Has nothing to do with that word over there in the Middle East. That's actually an acronym, uh, Hamas. But, uh, but it's just interesting that this is the Hebrew word for violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And the word corrupt could be translated ruin. The earth was in ruins, morally, spiritually. It was in complete shambles. And so, uh, and notice uh, the corruption was worldwide, the earth. This wasn't a local corruption, nor was it a local flood. It was a worldwide flood. And as we look in our day and age, is this what was, what's happening today? Is the world becoming corrupt? Is the world becoming full of violence? Oh, my. Wow, just look at the headlines of any day. Just pick a day and look at the headlines, and it's filled with violence today. It's, it's one thing after another. 
uh, parents killing their children, children killing their parents, uh, rape, sexual trafficking, all of that stuff. I mean, it's just one thing after another. The world is being filled with violence right now. Verse 13, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And word, the word ark literally means a box. Make a box. And this term is found only in Exodus 2 where it describes the basket in which the baby Moses was placed in the Nile. And Moses was protected from the waters as Noah is going to be protected. And it was to be made of gopher wood, which we don't have any idea what that was. It could have been cypress. It could have been pine. It could have been uh, cedar. Uh, or it could have been gopher wood which might have disappeared after the ark, after the flood, you see. We just don't know. And notice the ark was to be coated inside and out with pitch. And this is the Hebrew word which is translated in other places as atonement. It means to cover up. That's what atonement means, to cover up. Our sins, in other words. So the ark here is a picture of Jesus Christ, guys, who paid the price for us, who atoned for us, and we are safe when we are in him. They were safe when they were in the ark, you see. We're safe in Christ. So it's a picture, another picture, of Jesus. And the ark was probably uh, shaped like a giant barge, more, more like a barge than a boat. It wouldn't need to be boat-shaped because it had no motor. It had no sails. Its purpose was to float. <laughs> like ivory soap, it floats, right? The Septuagint describes it as a wooden box, indicating it was rectangular in shape. It's interesting that no ship of the size of Noah's Ark was built until the late 19th century with iron. Why do I bring that up? Because that shows you how strong this Ark would have had, had to be under the pressures that it was put under. So it was quite an amazing uh, uh, boat. Now, why he had Noah put pitch on the inside as well as the outside? You can understand the outside. But why on the inside? That's a mystery. Perhaps it was for added protection, but maybe God still has a plan for the ark yet in the future. I don't know. Maybe he wanted to preserve it all these years. There are references in literature and in other cultures of the ark being visible from ancient times all the way to recent times. Even Marco Polo spoke of the ark. And there have been expeditions up there, and they've taken pictures of what appears to be half of a buried wooden barge kind of a ship. And some say they, they've even been on the ark describing the rooms, etc. Is all that true? I don't know. I doubt it. I really do. But we don't need to find the ark to know it really happened. We trust in faith, right? And as we'll see, all of the dimensions are perfect for this ark. Verse 15, and this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Right. What's a cubit? <laughs> a cubit in the Old Testament is approximately 18 inches. And they measured it from the tips of the fingers to the elbow. So approximately 18 inches long. So... Looking at a comparison, the ark was 450 feet long and 45 feet high and 75 feet wide, rounding it all off. About a football field and a half long, three stories high of 15 feet each. And the ark had the same cargo capacity of a modern cargo ship. 
And so looking at it just from a different perspective, again, a football field and a half long. This was a long, long barge and uh, kind of amazing. And then comparing it to a cargo ship, just a little tiny bit smaller uh, than a cargo ship. And a uh, cargo ship is about 550 feet long. The ark had a volume of 1.4 million cubic feet and a gross tonnage of 14,000 tons. And this is a scale model, and you can see an ancient ship and a modern railroad boxcar in comparison. The ark is the equivalent to about 522 railroad boxcars. So picture stopping at a railroad crossing with the trains going by and all the boxcars. And if you're like me, I count them. Imagine counting 522 of them. That's how, that's how much this ark could carry. It could have carried over 125,000 sheep-sized animals. Interesting, there's less than 18,000 species of land animals alive today. And the average size of most animals is less than that of a sheep. The ark could have carried easily 120,000 sheep-sized animals. Now, now, a scale model of the ark was tested in a special tank at Scripps Institute of Oceanography at La Jolla, California. And the tank was capable of generating giant waves much larger than what would be expected in the ocean. And what they found, they proved that it was impossible to capsize the thing. Due to the rectangular shape, it righted itself every time, even to 90 degrees on its side. It righted itself. Today, most vesicles, most vesicles, most vessels will develop severe stability problems at a, a, a 60 degree list. Not 90 degrees. They're done at 90 degrees. And the ratio of the arc is 30 by 5 by 3 or 6 to 1. And it turns out that that's the perfect design to prevent capsizing in rough seas. I mean, well, it's God's measurements, right? He's got it down. Verse 16. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower second and third decks, so three decks in this ark. And a window at the top, which was one cubit wide, or 18 inches wide. And it appears that this window went around the whole entire ark for ventilation. <laughs> you can imagine, you know, what this ark was like with all those animals in it. Wow. And then mix that together with seasickness. Oh, you know. So ventilation was an important thing. And it had one door only on its side. One door. One way in. Jesus said, I am the door, right? I am the only way, truth, and the life. And so it had three decks, uh, floor space divided over three decks, which would have totaled 101,000 square feet. That is a fairly big warehouse building size. Verse 17, and behold, I myself... And bringing floodwaters on the earth. Who's doing this? I myself. It's, in other words, it's not a natural occurrence. God did this supernaturally. I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. So God did this. It's not a natural phenomenon. God caused it to happen, verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, Noah, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. So eight people went into the ark, God's covenant and promise to spare Noah, which he'll seal in the sky later on with the Rainbow, right? Exactly. Verse 19. 
And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Going back to how God created everything, male and female, verse 20. Of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind, notice this, will come to you to keep them alive. And, verse 21, you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. So notice the animals come to Noah. He doesn't go out and try to gather them. I mean, I couldn't imagine trying to gather every animal of its kind, you know. We have trouble with three cows, so trying to gather them and herd them, you know. Uh, so uh, that would have been an impossible test. So the animals actually came to the ark, to Noah. And so the Lord took care of it. And looking at the three uh, different decks Uh, And because the pre-flood climate was much more stable than the post-flood climate, all the animals of every kind would have been all around the ark, not spread out in different regions of the earth. Uh, Dr. Henry Morris writes this, The scope was quite comprehensive. Two of every kind, allowing then for two of each species, there might have to be a total of about 72,000 animals on the ark, say 75,000 to allow for the extra animals in each clean species. Since we have already seen the ark could have carried as many as 125,000 sheep, and since the average size of land animals is... uh, Uh, Surely less than that of a sheep, it's obvious that no more than 60% of its capacity would have to be used for animals. Yeah. Yeah. There would have had to be representatives of of dinosaurs on, yep. Actually, it it, it would have been less than this since the biblical kind is probably considerably broader than that of the arbitrary arbitrary species category of modern biology. And so way more than enough room for animals and food and Noah and his uh, family and whatever else would need to be on board as well. Once on board, the animals, Noah's family, once on board, all of the earth's future was huddled under one roof. I mean, that is, blows your mind, doesn't it? All what's on earth now, all came from that, what was under that one roof. Thus, Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So he did. So interesting, seven times it records that the Lord spoke to Noah. And Noah found grace and had fellowship with God and he walked with God. He was justified and he was obedient to the word of God. It never tells us what Noah was thinking or feeling through all this. That's absent from the record. Just that he was obedient by faith. And so Hebrews, the faith chapter, picks it up in Hebrews 11 verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Wow. So the saving of his household. Man, may our households be found in Christ. And may we be counted as those who walk with God. Noah is still preaching to this day. He's preaching to us right now, teaching us to trust the Lord and have faith in the Lord always, to be found in Christ. If they weren't in that boat, they were not saved. And it's a perfect picture of Jesus Christ being the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Well, that's it. We're going to stop there. A little short 
uh, chapter before we get into chapter 7, and uh, we'll pick it up next time. Father, we thank you uh, for your word again uh, tonight, Lord, and wow, what an amazing, amazing event that really took place. We don't need to find an ark to, <laughs> to believe that it took place. We know it took place. And all of the perfect measurements and uh, the, the perfect dimensions of this barge in order to, to endure all of this, just incredible, Lord. Thank you. Praise you, Lord, that you did this and that you saved this family through it, through this uh, tribulation of a flood. Lord, I just uh, pray that we would, again, meditate on these things and that as we leave here, Lord, we would go out uh, just thinking about these things and realizing we're in the last days and people need to be found in you or they're going to perish. So, Lord, may our lives be that example. May just as people see us, and see our lives, and see what we're doing, and what we're saying, may they just see Christ in us. And then more than that, Lord, may we be bold. May you give us the boldness to preach righteousness to this world that is becoming evil, more and more evil every day. I pray that you'd fill us with your spirit, God, so that your spirit just overflows out of us, torrents of living water. And again, thank you for your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. time of need you have heard my cry I'm drawn by your love you are my shelter Lord through the storms of life my anchor of hope She
Jesus.